Welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where Pastor Jeff Cranston, along with our host, Jen Denton, will discuss biblical theology in an understandable way. You'll discover how to apply biblical truth to your life. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Well, hello again, y'all, and welcome back to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Jen Denton, and along with Pastor Jeff Cranston, we're systematically unfolding what the scripture teaches regarding what many of us find to be hard to understand, hard to reach theological topics. But we believe what the reformer John Calvin said, doctrine is rightly received when it takes possession of the entire soul and finds a dwelling place and shelter in the most intimate affections of the heart. And here at Kitchen Table Theology, we desire to help you receive doctrine and have that move into your heart, not just your head. We're currently looking at a number of things, 33 in fact, that instantaneously occur in the life of the believer at the moment of salvation. So far, we've unpacked that the believer is part of God's eternal plan and that forgiveness from our transgressions also takes place. Pastor Jeff, what are we diving into today? Well, hello again, Miss Jen, and hello, Kitchen Table Theologians. So, Jen, we're going to look into the word adoption. I'm excited about this concept. It's one of the riches of divine grace that God sends our way instantaneously at the moment of salvation. We're adopted. And I think we can really resonate, we can relate to this topic, at least in an earthly concept, because we all know families who've adopted a child, many in our church family, or maybe children, and we see the love that they bring in that act, in that, that adding to their family in that very special way. And each adoption has a very special story. Some children are adopted right here, close to home, and other times... I know friends that have done this flown halfway around the world to bring a child into their family. And it's a beautiful, selfless act just to think about what's inherent in adoption. It's voluntary, it's selfless, it's loving, it's sacrificial, and so much more. Yeah, I know a, I know a, a family where they have 10 children and they adopted seven of them. Hmm. And some are from the U.S. and some are from Africa, and they're from all over the world. And, and you know, we would be completely forgiven if we assume that God's adoption of us is just like a family's adoption of a child who wasn't born into their family. I mean, that only makes sense, right? And, and this doctrine of adoption is not limited to, but it's based upon two verses from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So, Jen, how about reading reading that for us, please? Just as he who chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Yeah, the, the Bible tells us that everyone who's accepted Christ as Savior has been adopted into the family of God. And it, it pleases God to make us a part of his family. He wants us to know and experience, which is so awesome. He wants us to know and experience his love and his acceptance. So then does the biblical doctrine of adoption kind of line up or keep step with our understanding of adoption? Well, yes and and no. The word adoption literally means placing as a son, and it describes all the rights, all the privileges, as well as the new position of a believer in Christ. So Paul, writing to the Ephesians, he took that, that word adoption from a Roman custom where in a legal ceremony, the adopted son was given all the rights of a natural-born son. Dr. Paul Enns, in in his book, The Moody Handbook of Theology, tells us that in that legal Roman transaction, four things took place. So number one, the adopted son lost any and all rights from his old family, if there was one, and gained all the rights as a fully legitimate son in the new family. Secondly, he became an heir to his adopted father's estate. Thirdly, the former life of the adopted person was legally wiped out. For example, if he had debts, they were wiped out and canceled as if they had never been. And fourthly, in the eyes of Roman law, the adopted person was literally and absolutely the new son of his new father. 
that sounds somewhat familiar to what we have here, except for the wiping out the debt part. If that's the case, I want, I want somebody to adopt me here. <laughs> <or her. laughs> sorry, sorry, mama. Sorry, daddy. <laughs> somebody can take care of that. But why did Paul choose to refer to the Roman way of doing things and not the Jewish way? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good point. Good question. Paul was writing to the Ephesians when he used the word adoption. So this church scattered throughout a pretty big region, consisted of men and women of various backgrounds, but they all lived in a Roman jurisdiction. They all lived under Roman rule. And it was, Ephesus was in fact the capital city of the Roman province of Asia. So they would have been quite familiar with the law and the particular surrounding adoption in Roman culture. It's it's likely many of them knew adopted people, just like you and I do. Maybe even some of them had been adopted according to Roman law. Okay, so so that makes sense. And let's let's bring it back to where we started. How does all of this apply to our new life in Christ as far as what takes place at the moment of our salvation? Well, a few things happen when we are saved, and this doctrine of adoption kicks in on our behalf. We we are immediately released from slavery into freedom and maturity in Christ. Romans 8 talks about this. We're also released from the bondage we were under regarding the law, the the Jewish law, into a new status as a son or a daughter. And, And that's one of the differences between Roman custom and Roman law and what God does with us, by the way. So what do you mean? So in Roman law, we discover adoption applied to sons to males, not so much to daughters. Girls, of course, were taken in and girls were adopted into families, but they were not recipients of the father's estate. God, however, didn't do it that way. Whether you're male or female, when he adopted you, you were immediately accorded all rights and privileges as a child of God. Okay, good. I was going to (laughs) ask. I'm glad you covered that. I was hoping you were going to say that. Yeah, and not only that, but in addition, we we enjoy a new relationship with God wherein we may now address Him as Abba Father, right? We've talked about this before, and that's this intimate term of address used by a child in in addressing his or her father. Ephesians 1.5 also seems to indicate that the act of adoption is connected with predestination, having taken place in eternity past, but but realized and actualized when the person places his or her faith solely in Jesus Christ for salvation. So now I want to go back to something you said near the top of the podcast when I asked you if the biblical doctrine of adoption lines up with our understanding of adoption, the way that families do it that we're familiar with. And you said yes and no. What do you what do you mean by that? Yeah, I was hoping that you weren't going to remember that. <laughs> nope. Steel trap up here, Dr. Cranston, (laughs) steel trap. That's what we're dealing with. Okay. Well, yeah, I said (laughs) yes and no, and we've kind of covered the yes parts. There are many similarities between our adoption as Christians, children of God, and the way that we understand adoption in our our own culture um, today. But so there, there are in many ways a lot of similarities, but there is something significantly different and how God adopts us. And I, I mean, I mean, really, really different. So what is it? Come on. <laughs> Am I stringing this out long enough for yes, you? Yes, come on. Okay. <laughs> so the, the way that we do it here. So if you and Fred or Darlene and I want to go and adopt a child, what that in essence is an outsider to the family becomes an insider with the family, right? An outsider becomes an insider. They, they become a member of a family of which they were not previously a member. So God's way goes like this, and it's pretty incredible. So let's now call it divine adoption. And and, and Jen, I'll just personalize it to you. When you came to faith in Christ, at the moment of your salvation, you were immediately made a child of God at your new birth. And this happened by and through God's Holy Spirit. And we've talked about this many, many times here on Kitchen Table Theology. You immediately, snapped fingers, became a child of God. But now here's the difference. In equal measure, you were declared an adult child of God in your relationship to God. 
Okay, you're going to have to explain that because I don't understand how if it's this new relationship and yes, I can resonate with now I'm a child of God. I don't think I immediately mature in my faith, right? Okay, so check this out. At the moment you were of regeneration, at the moment you were saved, you were born of God, became a child of God, therefore the legitimate offspring, as it were, of God. And you were advanced in relationship and you were advanced in responsibility to the position of an adult daughter or in other cases, a, an adult son. Why? Well, I don't know. Why are you asking me? I, I'm just saying. <laughs> because I don't good. understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know that that was necessary, but God, God did it. So, all childhood years, spiritually speaking, all adolescent years, spiritually speaking, which are normal in the, in our human experience, are excluded in spiritual sonship and the newly born again believer is, is at once in possession of, and here's the spiritual aspect. We are in possession of freedom. We have been freed from tutors, teachers, professors, spiritually speaking, who symbolize the principle of the law. So, you know, when you're growing up, you're going to school, you're having to learn all these things. You have you have a teacher, you have a master, you have a tutor, you have somebody along those lines. But in Scripture, that concept symbolizes the law. And now you're responsible. You're, you're freed from that, having to learn the law and come along that way. You're immediately taken beyond that and placed in a position of responsibility to live a full org spiritual life of an adult in the father's house. So there is no period in the Christian life of irresponsible childhood that is ever acknowledged. So there there's there's no toddler phase for a Christian. There's no bizarre middle school boy phase <laughs> for a Christian, right? We're put into a position of responsibility and maturity. For for example, there are no texts of Scripture which seek to direct the conduct of beginners in the Christian life as distinct to those who are mature in the Christian life. Wait, 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 though, because I can think of several points. I can't quote the address, <laughs> but yeah. somewhere in the New Testament where it talks about being a baby in Christ and you were drinking milk and food and it walks through that whole analogy. Is is that true or am I remembering that correctly? I think that's in the book of Second Hesitations. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're remembering that exactly. But think about it. When, when you read a command to a believer in Scripture, it's not predicated upon how long you are in the faith. When you When we have a principle to live out, when we have a command to obey, if you're in Christ one day or you're in Christ 50 years, the command is exactly the same. So scripture never treats Christians as infants versus mature people. So what you're thinking about, I believe, is 1 Corinthians 3 1. And Paul is telling those Corinthian believers, believers, he said, I can't talk to you as spiritual people, but only fleshly ones. And he says, I have to treat you as infants. Or babes in Christ. So is that the one you're thinking about? Yeah. So that's, that's what I can't reconcile. I can't. So if that's there, if somewhere we're called Christians, infants or babies in Christ, and then you've just said an adoption, we kind of skip over that. How does that work itself out? So he didn't say they were babes in Christ. He said, I have to treat you as such. Hmm. Okay. So there's experience and there's position. Positionally, they are what God declared them to be. Experientially, the way that they're living this out, they're acting like a bunch of little babies. So that, that's mm -hmm. a good question. So what I believe Paul's referring to in this First Corinthians 3 passage is that those believers were, in his minds, babes due to their carnality and not because of their immaturity in years in the Christian life. Does that make sense? So. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking to you because you're immature, because you've only been a Christian for two years. I'm talking to you as a babe and teaching you as an infant because of the carnality that is still evidence in your life. So th their carnality at that time was overriding their desire to walk in what they truly were in Christ. 
Okay. That makes more sense. And it sounds like something we would do in our own human nature. (laughs) Yeah. So, but positionally, we are placed way beyond being a babe in Christ. And I'll just go back to it. Every command in scripture, every teaching in scripture, every precept, every principle is given to the Christian. And they, there are not varying degrees of these principles, precepts, and, and directives. So if you've been in, in as a Christian five years, okay, then you have to obey this, but you don't have to obey that. We don't get any of that. If you've been a Christian 50 years, okay, well, you really know. So you don't have to obey these three things, but you still do have to obey those five things. We don't get any of that in Scripture. So we are all treated as mature in Christ positionally. That doesn't mean we're actually experientially walking that that out. So as we draw this to a close, in, in our in our human experience, yeah, in our, in our head, I want to say, in our human experience, legitimate birth and adoption never occur in the same person. So in other words, a father or a mother never adopt their own child, right? I mean, that would be ridiculous. You give birth to a daughter, you don't then have to adopt her. There's never a reason for that to happen. So in the realm of God's divine adoption, every child born of God is adopted at the moment he or she is born. So there's another difference. In human life, you don't adopt a child that you've given birth to, but in our spiritual lives, we are adopted the moment we are born or born again. And then we are then placed before God as responsible believers, positionally. In that sense, then adoption really becomes one of the most important undertakings at the moment of salvation. And it it's incredible to think about. It really is. I mean, we become members of God's very own family. So we, we are adopted. Think about that. We're adopted by the creator of the universe. And in his eyes, we are fully grown and we are mature and we are responsible. Why? Because of our position in Christ. That's the kicker. It's because of our position in Christ. We become heirs of all that he and heaven have to offer. And one of the reasons why we get together and chat like this on Kitchen Table Theology is so that we can understand that positionally and experientially. To not only know it, but apply it. We say it. We say it all the time. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks as always, everyone, for listening to Kitchen Table Theology. And if you haven't done so yet, like or subscribe at Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening from if you are enjoying the show. And kindly rate us and leave a review as well. Also, don't forget to check out today's episode notes. And as a reminder, our episodes are edited and noted by sound design engineer Danny and her team at Streamline Podcast. And you can learn more about their incredible work at StreamlinePodcast.com. Also, when you get a chance, head on over to JeffCranston.com for more information about Dr. Cranston, his books, his sermons, his leadership notes, and blog posts. Next week, we're back with another great episode about... Want to fill us in on what next week is about? I don't have that. I don't have that in front of me. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, we're going to find out. It will be an adventure for all of us. <laughs> yeah. We, no, we do have one. I just don't have it in front of me. That's okay. That's okay. Well, this week we're going to have some homework. We're all going to go deeper. And until next time, always remember once again that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Jen Denton and Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, you can check out the show notes at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review on iTunes? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's Word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.